morning. You all right? Sorry, afternoon. It is afternoon. I think we're both feeling it, aren't we? A little bit. After the party time at the weekend. Yes. Everyone surprised me. I had a surprise party. Well, I say everyone. Kate did it. Kate, give me a surprise 40th birthday party. 24th birthday party. That's it. I had no idea. I genuinely didn't. I thought you'd click. Can't no. No. Yeah. She could be banging blokes behind my back, mate. I'd have no idea. <laughs> so, yes, you saw heads the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's carnage. I think you're going to stitch me up with plenty of cuttings, aren't you? I might drop the odd uh, dancing video in. I have had a lot of comments, though, about the uh, Alan Partridge done at the last video. <laughs> that was funny. That made me laugh. It's always a surprise for me. I, know. I never know what you're going to put in. <laughs> Smell my cheek, you mother! Anyway, let's cut, cut through it. Let's get through it. it. Must still be half cut. Let's get through it. And I'll see you episode of this. So, oh. yeah, well, you did it. Yep. I haven't got to do it now. I haven't got to do it. You're fine. Um, it might be a bit too much wind noise. Wind noise. So if apologies. it is, we'll get inside as quickly as we can. Yeah. It's just a quick rundown. Ferrari's on a dyno. Uh, we're waiting on some bits and pieces to come in for Benz. Uh, we're waiting on Tyler's to get collected. Uh, we are waiting on uh, front end parts to turn up for the black one. We're waiting. I've started sorting the block and the pistons and rods for the blue one. Mm -hmm. We're waiting on window regulator for the grey one over here. Waiting on suspension control unit for the Maserati. Paul's turned up today. That's service and a remap. Um, bum, 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 bum. What is that one? Uh, that's waiting on warranty. Yep. Uh, the RS6 is oil leak and carbon ceramic brakes for Richard. Wills is having a, like a, a few updates put on the back end, so he's got a different diffuser and different lights. Uh, George has done about 500 miles in his now, so we're just getting it back for a check over, because obviously we did quite a lot of work on that. So just check it over. The Lambo just needs running on the dyno. We've done just a bit of a health check on it for him. Uh, Adams, I've got to finish putting together all the prices and bits and pieces and let him know what's what. And then Jordan's pipe has turned up for his van. And that is it out here. Let's go inside because it's windy. Job done. You still filming? I am. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, Matt is doing service and suspension. And then it can go for MOT. Um, Oliver's is wet. <laughs> so we've just got to sort that out. Oh, I've got to check it over. It got, it got his garage flooded or something. So he just wants us to check it over because when he turned it on and run it up, he had a load of warning lights. So we just need Oops. to go through it. Uh, the McLaren, which I think we touched on last week, the smoking McLaren yep. has got a knackered valve guide. And when we go in the engine room, I will show you it because we've got the head stripped. So yeah, that's a bit of a, bit of a tale of woe, but we fix it. We can fix it. And then, and then, we have got, uh, this is a DCT box from Israel that Carl's in the middle of stripping down at the minute, or we're getting apart. And if you look here, there should be one of these uh, yellow magnets on that post there, and the magnet's fallen off. So we lost gears. Um, that's Corey's one, so we're just, waiting for second gear to arrive from Dodson for that, and then that can go back together. And this is one for um, Jürgen at JM. And that's dropped second gear as well. There we go. There we go. So we've got three on the go at the minute, plus uh, manual conversion as well for another gearbox that's going to Israel. Uh, so we're manual converting this one, so we've got New selector assembly, new shifter, shift rods and arms. Um, so yeah, last few little bits and pieces. Is he busy? Yeah, he's pretty busy. He is pretty busy. And then... Uh, let's show you this McLaren head. Wants to party all the time. Uh, oh. 
And two, and two, mean that one I would have thought. Put it in the hole, lad. There you go. Do 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 Pretty knackered, isn't it? Yep. A lot of play. Like nothing in that one. Nothing in that one. Right, is it? Mm -mm. Something's broken. Yeah, and the exhaust on the same cylinder is just as bad. There we go. Yep, there it is. Wibbly wobbly. Not yeah. good. No. But we found it. Yeah. Found the problemo. So that's okay. Um, so we need to get that sorted. The Mercer Lago's in here, the McLaren's in here, there's a V10 down there, the TTRS is at the back. Lots going on. Yeah. There we go. A new year, a brand new me. Yes. Entering a new decade of... A new decade, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, Jordan's moved my bike. Yeah, it's pretty carnage, mate. Pretty carnage. Um, should we do it here? Why not? I've got some questions. Where do I put them? Do you want to take a seat? Have a seat, Dav. Oh, question from Simon. <laughs> no, you fell off the table. From Simon Presley. Um, I really, oddly maybe, love E61 M5. Are they as reliable as folks say? And if so, what's your experience of them in making them better? I have no idea, mate. Um, I've worked on a couple of V10 M M5s in the past, but I don't know enough about them to give you any advice about those. Um, so I have no idea. The go. only people I can think of who are good with M5s are either Dale Auto Works or Imran at Evolve. They're the only two I can think of, really. Um, G underscore Allen. Ricky, can you explain more the long life oil quality sensor? I didn't know that was a thing. So if your car is set to long life servicing and a service light comes on, it's not due to mileage or time. No, that's right. It's, so the oil quality sensor, in essence, takes a tiny little sample of oil and looks at the carbon it's carrying. So it looks at the quality of the oil and then it reports back to the dash. So if you're on long life servicing and your service light comes on, it's because your oil is degraded. Um, so, I'm trying to think what, yeah, I'm sure they are the Delphi or Continental sensors, but that's what an oil quality sensor is, which is why then when people say, oh, supercars are long life servicing, full of crap, because they haven't got an oil quality sensor. So that's how it should be anyway. Um, Ricky, love the comment. Great mix of technical, general business updates and banter. What's the story with the green machine that's taken up valuable ramp space? Can you spill the beans on that project yet? Yeah. Uh, it, all I can say is at the minute is, is something for Skoda. It's not been done before hence why it's taken so long to get to this stage. Um, but there is factory involvement. So until they're happy that it's done and finished, yeah, you're just gonna have to stay tuned in. Be patient. Yeah, yeah, but it will be cool. Uh, J12K, Audi R8 transmission, pros and cons of R-Tronic versus S-Tronic. Have you done a video on this or bin them both and choose a manual? Uh, I would always choose S-Tronic first because they're faster on track. Uh, the R-Tronic is a good gearbox if you know how to drive it properly because they were in the GTs, the first R8 GTs. You've just got to slightly lift your throttle when you shift gear, otherwise the car does the torque, drops the torque for you and you get that sort of nodding dog feeling when you're driving. The manuals and the R-Tronic gearbox as a base are the same. They're an L156 Graziano box, so they're the same. They're really agricultural, nothing special. Um, it's just either you control it with your hand or you control it with a big solenoid block on the top that does the gear changes. So they were only in V8s and V10s up to uh, basically the facelift. Then the R-Tronic got dropped at facelift, which is like 2013 onwards. 
The S-Tronic or DCT, which is a dual clutch transmission, has two clutches, two input shafts, and then essentially two gearbox that run inside one another. So they've got first, third, fifth, and seventh, and then reverse. Yeah. Right, start again. Talk about R8 and an R8 starts off. Yeah, cool. exactly that. That's how the world works. Um, a S-Tronic or DCT is two gearboxes inside one another. Um, so it's reverse, second, fourth and sixth, and then first, third, fifth and seventh. And it will sit there and you're engaged in third and the other side of the gearbox will engage fourth and then they just swap the clutches over. So the time between gear shifts is, is massive. It's so much faster. Um, it just comes down to which one do I prefer? S-Tronic is faster on track. Which one's dearer to fix? The S-Tronic. Um, which ones do we see more problems with? Mm -hmm. A toss up between R-Tronic and S-Tronic. Tells you everything you need to know. Um, so yeah, the S-Tronic can get really expensive to fix. They're hard to find secondhand. Um, the R-Tronic, we can get everything for and we can fix them. But again, they're expensive to fix. The manuals are pretty good. They just normally, if they're gonna go wrong, they normally knock out second gear synchros. So it'll graunch into second or graunch into third. We've had a couple of those. Um, the clutches for an R-Tronic and a manual, by the time you've done the job, well, a clutch on his own is 1,300 quid, um, plus the slave cylinders, another 600 pound, and all the seals and bits and pieces. An S-Tronic clutch is like two grand. Um, but we can do an S-Tronic clutch quicker than we can do a manual or an R-Tronic clutch. So it swings and roundabouts there. Um, but the S-Tronic for me, because it gives lap time, which is probably why I'd say it's yep. better. Uh, Mark Walton, Ricky, did you ever consider a five-cylinder or an R32 for the Noble? Uh, a five-cylinder as an Adaza, I did, but we couldn't fit the, I didn't think we could fit the engine and the gearbox in, in the space we had, really. I think it was too wide. Um, so that's why I binned that off. The R32 or the VR6 engine, it's been done, it's an old engine, didn't really, I didn't really fancy it. The four-cylinder, not too, I think the four-cylinder sound all right to be fair, but I've done it because I can put a DCT in it. So I've got a 250, DQ250 with a good diff in it. Um, and then I've had EcoTune's new head and turbo kit as well, which is a four-port head like off the of Skoda Rally cars. So it just, it probably just excited me a little bit more. So that's where we went that way really. Um, I just really struggled to get decent parts for that Noble engine. Um, and even when I went, I, I bought pistons and then like went to Cosworth and they're like, oh yeah, we don't make the rings for that anymore. So it just started to turn into a bit of a nightmare. Um, Stephen Bates, what's the power and torque on a 355, please? It's in there. So when we know, you'll know. Um, Ast 6537. I don't know what it costs you to have a day away from work but I run a normal garage in Yorkshire and I play golf. I get lads saying, come on Andy, let's go here or there. They didn't realize what it's cost me to have a day off, even leaving the lads to do what they're doing. My question is, how do you price your Saudi trips? Are you always thinking about your garage at home? Even when I do go away, I can't switch off. I never think about the money. I think about the plates spinning here that the lads can't spin. So when I'm away, what's gonna go wrong? What can't I keep on top of? Have I forgotten something? Have I not ordered a part? So I don't worry about the money. I worry about the house of cards falling down, really. Um, when I price a trip, I just price myself out at a day rate and I charge like a wounded rhino. Um, <laughs> because if I'm going away from my fa it's not just for me, it's not just about eight hours out of the workshop or, you know, time away from work. It's also, time away from my family that I can never get back or you know so for me if I'm going away I'll make it worth our while not my while I'll make it worth our while yep. um, and if people don't pay it that's fine it's not compulsory um, I just look at it differently to how I charge out here um, and I never switch off 
first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is look at my phone or look at the bank and the last thing I do when I go to bed at night is the same. So, um, yeah, even at my surprise 40th birthday, I couldn't switch off from work because I was surrounded by the wankers. <laughs> <laughs> um, PJ Vendor, great video. The techie ones are the best. How much of the build process would you say is commercially sensitive? Your co competitive advantage, so to say. I know what you're trying to ask, or I know what you're trying to say. Um, I'm not worried about showing you how I put an engine together. I'm not too worried about showing the process. Um, there's a couple of ways I do things that I wouldn't show, but I'd never really say it. I just wouldn't show it. Um, the, the sort of, um, the secret bit almost is um, like clearances or how, what works together, what package works with what, when I'm using this fuel and this power, what ring clearance or what piston to wall or what camp, like cam timing. So that, that stuff I wouldn't give away, but showing you how to put a V10 together, yeah, I'm not bothered about that. The only thing we have to be careful of with the DL800 gearboxes is um because we're dodds and pro dealers we're not allowed to show other people how to do it so if i wasn't a pro detailer a pro dealer um i could do what i wanted but because i've kind of bought in to their program and i get the luxury of being able to buy their parts then i can't really do a strip down video or a build video because they don't want to arm their competition which i get um so there are certain things i'm not allowed to do um, for like at the minute, the Skoda, I'm not allowed to do certain things there. Certain customers will ask me not to give away certain stuff. And then there's certain stuff I won't give away because I don't want to arm, I don't want to arm my competition. Sounding arrogant, not really that I have any, so. Yeah. Not here anyway. I don't build drag cars like in America or stuff like that, but there's no one in the UK doing what we do. Um, so, the next page. Uh, just finished reading Four Stroke Performance by A. Graham Bell. Uh, this is by I2 Yan, um, based on engine builds. Please keep the tech videos coming. Would you ever consider getting into machine inside of your workshop? Um, uh, no, I would never do the machine inside. Uh, that is an art and a life's work all on its own. So leave a machine into the machinists in the same way that I think 99% of machinists would say they're not engine builders. Um, it is probably more common in America that engine shops do engine builds and do the machining. And they're probably places over here, but the equipment I would need to be able to do everything to the level I do it now, um, easy quarter of a million quid. Well, a sturdy head cutting machine is 60 grand. Then, by the time you go and get a decent boring honing machine, one that can also line home, then balancing machines, yeah, it's not worth it really. So, um, best engine ever made. This is a hard one, I thought about this. I think probably one of the most influential engines, I think, is if you take away the very first internal combustion engine, but from a racing point of view, for me, one of the most influential engines, especially in racing, is the Ford DFE. And the reason that was is because from the tip of the trumpet in the plenum, the transition all the way down to the turn in the valve, in the inlet valve, is perfect. It was all designed around that. The split of the heads, uh, the mechanical engineering of the engine and how it was pieced together it was all around the airflow into the inlet. And if you go up and Google it, there's been a lot of technical papers on it. It is. It is very impressive, even down to the taper from the tip of the trumpet to the throat of the valve, the taper is just perfect. Whereas normally there's other um, packaging constraints, whereas it was like that, when they designed that engine, they went, right, two parallel lines, that's our intake line, everything else is built around that. No compromise. No compromise, not on that. Yeah. Um, so that was quite an interesting one. <laughs> Uh, ultimate free car garage, ha. Ferrari F40, Ferrari 360 Challenge Stradale, and a TA22 Celica GT there you go. in red. Hmm. Favourite engine to work on? That is a hard one because I love working on bike engines. Um, 
I've built loads and loads of Yamaha R6 engines. Um, I've built loads and loads of Evos. I've built loads of V10s. The nicest engine to work that I've probably pushed to the limit the most is probably the Daza. I think we were holding power records and drag records for quite a while in Europe with them. So I would probably say at the minute, that's the one I'd, I've done the most. I've pushed to the limit the most, so I've done the most development on. Um, the McLaren, we've done a lot of development, but reverse engineering parts to make them work. So that's a different kind of, um, that was a different kind of thesis working on those. Um, so yeah, probably, I like putting Dazzers together as well, they're yeah. good. Uh, what's it like crashing at 140 mile an hour? It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. What do you think? Crashing at 140 mile an hour, done it? Don't crash. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> Call me Mitchell. <laughs> uh, no, I can't imagine it would be great. No. Especially on a bike. No, it's not. It either burns because you slide yeah. forever, or like um, the one I had last year where you're bouncing through the grass, you're going, when is this going to fucking end? Yeah, I could imagine. We're back. We are. I had to go and sort a customer out. Um, what did we get to? We were talking about what it's like to crash. Oh yeah. It's fun. <laughs> no. What hurts? High sides hurt the most. Yep. High sides hurt the most. When you lose the front, it doesn't normally, like last year, what did I do? Uh, yeah, I lost the front. I, I high sided at Pem. Yeah, high side, I crashed twice that weekend. I high sided at the hairpin. Um, that was in the wet and that hurts, that like slams you down. Um, the biggest one was at Coombe 10 years ago. That was a monster. I saw space come down fucking snow on me. Wow. Um, that was a bad one. Uh, brands where I broke my arm was a high side. Um, but yeah, my two fast ones, I closed the front. Oh, one at Alton, one at, um, one last year. And you just, if you slide, it's all right. You kind of see what's going on and you are trying to slow yourself down because your ass is on fire normally. <laughs> But the one last year, I tumbled for forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and it didn't stop. Um, and that's, you have, you realize you have no control and stuff like that. You don't know whether you're tangled up in a bike, whether you hit the, you know, you could be upside down, whatever, and you smash into tire wall. So those are the ones that can do some damage. Um, it's all right, it's all good fun. <laughs> we won't do it this year. No. Well, I try not to, I never try to. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's that, it's part of the buzz, isn't it? Well, if, if you're not pushing, so. you're yeah, not... yeah. If you're not crashing, you're not pushing hard enough. That's the one. Yeah, pretty much. Um, who are your favorite YouTubers? Hmm. I've got a couple, but I would probably say the ones I watch most regularly is M539 Restorations, the BMW guy. The Monopoly man. Um, Cut it edge engineering. Um, that's really cool. That's about like um, like proper heavy industry um, restorations. Yep. Uh, Jamzy Online, they're engine builders, father and son engine builders in America. And then Gypsy Tales, he goes, does some cool podcasts. So he's had like Casey Stoner, he's a massive into motocross and supercross, so that's quite cool. So Gypsy Tales. Yes, that is about it. There we go. And our big talking topic is well, you shouldn't buy a 30 grand R8. I think that's what we were going to go for, wasn't it? I think so. What is that it? It kind of bounced off your... Uh, yeah. On my bobble. <laughs> oh, your bobble. It hit my bobble. It hit your bobble. Well, it's difficult to miss your bobble. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, we've had a couple of people mention this, because um, I always say, don't buy a 30 grand R8. And even though the market is kind of in a hard place at the minute. Um, so we'd done an inspection start of last week and the guy bought it for 31,000 pounds. Is it for 33 or 34 and he got a deal. Um, and it needed two mag ride dampers. Uh, it needed front brakes. Um, the, the clutch pedal was stiff. So the clutch wasn't sli slipping, but the clutch pedal was stiff. Um, and it needed a head unit um, because the nav drive wasn't working and like the estimate is 14 grand. 14? 14 grand. Wow. Yeah, rear dampers are now 1,400 quid each. Uh, front brake discs are 700 quid, a set of pads is 600 quid. Um, yeah, 
Uh, slave cylinder now is £690, the clutch is 1400 quid. Head unit was three grand. Three. All right, you would go to like an RTA or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. And that's not me taking the piss with labor. That's just parts, parts heavy. You know, this is what we're sort of saying about, yeah, I love the DCTs in them, but they're 35 grand for a gearbox. Yeah. You know, so this is get an inspection. Not saying necessarily us, but if you're looking at buying an R8, especially a bargain basement one, unless you're in a fortunate position, like say we are, where your labor's for free and you have R8 bits lying around everywhere that you've collected over nearly 10 years, get it checked. Because not they are money pits, they're bloody reliable and they are good. But if you start getting certain things wrong and you buy it and then you've got to figure out or you've got to get it fixed, yeah. then you're just throwing money away. Throwing money away. Because you know, because the problem is, 30 grand R8 is normally going to be like 50, 60,000 miles. It doesn't matter how much money you put into that car, you're never going to bring the mileage back out of it. So that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty. And then because times are hard at the minute with interest rates and people are trying to get out of cars, you're starting to see, people are starting to blur the lines between a good car that is going cheap and a knackered car that is just naturally cheap. Yeah. So just get it checked. I said to everybody, get an inspection done. Don't just necessarily go to your local garage who works on your focus. These people need to be pulling covers off and going from top to bottom because yeah. three or four little things need doing. And it's, well, I tell everybody, work on a thousand pound and niggle. That's like a little, and I said to everybody looking at buying cars, just work on a thousand pound a niggle. If you find six niggles, work on the fact that it's a grand a niggle. You know, we've just uh, done a super for James and he was on a drive and his cat temp sensor control module failed. And it's like 2,300 quid just for the sensor. And that's what people don't forget. Yes, they're cheap. They are cheap. They're cheaper than Golf R's. They're cheaper than RS3's, but they're still supercar money to fix. Yeah. <clears throat> so I keep saying it all the time. Don't buy a 30 grand R8. Don't do it. Don't Have do it. Have you considered buying a 30 grand R8? But even then, like if I was buying a 30 grand R8, I, I would have to be prepared to straight away throw away tires, brakes and suspension. Yep. So the only reason I would consider a 30 grand R8, and it'd have to be a V10, is if I'm building a track car. Right. Because I think Nigel Pindlewagon, who's got the crazy aero golf, aero that's golf. what he's looking for. Yeah. He's looking for a V10 manual that's got knackered brakes and suspension. Cause he's like, Rick, I'm just gonna throw it all away. Yeah. So to him, even though you're not gonna get a 30 grand V10, but you're talking 40, there's a place for that. Yeah. But if you're like working up into a supercar world or you've saved all your pennies, do you know what I mean? They're still fucking expensive to fix. Yeah. Still expensive to fix. And that's what, you know, people forget the black twin turbo at the back that um, has had a little prang on the front. It's a little prang. I mean, you've seen it. It's done the bumper, it's done the headlights, it's done the bonnet. Yep. 27 grand. 27. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With everything, with the wrap, with the paint, yep. with everything, with all the parts. Yeah, yeah. It's 27,000 pounds to fix. Damn. And the thing is, is warranty company don't pay that. Sorry, insurance company don't pay that. So the owner's got to pay to that. Yeah. So the owner's got to pay their excess, which depending on what your policy could be anything between 250, zero yep. to two grand. So they got to pay the excess. They got to pay the excess on the, the VAT on the excess and they've got to pay the VAT. So that's two on every 10. So all of a sudden you do, you know, 20 grand worth of damage to your R8. You got to pay four grand in VAT plus your excess, say grand. So you could be into like five, six grand in. Easily. Yeah. In, just to pay your insurance. <laughs> People forget that. Insurance companies don't pay that. Sorry, insurance companies don't pay that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a really interesting point, you know. Yeah. Because that's not something that was on my radar. No, don't, insurance companies don't pay that. I've never dealt with insurance company pay that. We've always, always, customers always have to pay the VAT. Yeah. Yeah. Whether that's different policy to policy, I don't know, but I know definitely on that. And I know the last time we had problems getting Kate's, not Kate's, this one that's just been done, but we had a car knocked and we had it fixed, we had to pay the VAT on it. So beware. Buyers beware.
caveat emptor. Don't buy a 30 grand R8. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And on that bombshell. Yes. Are we going to JDM tomorrow? Do you want to go? Possibly. 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 I need to give Paul a call because he didn't get back to me. All right, okay. Right, I'll let you ring him. I'm going to go and put the kettle on. Okay. And um, I'll let you decide what videos of hilarity you're going to drop in this <laughs> from my night of... It was banging night, to be fair. It was Kate night. smashed it. <laughs> How long did you say? It was like October she was planning it, wasn't she? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So... Secret squirrel. Didn't have a clue, mate. <laughs> Not until she said, oh, the hotel room we're staying is, is upstairs. And so I went up the stairs yeah. and she goes, first door on the right. And it says emergency exit. Yeah. And I put my hand on the door and I'm like, ah, there is something a foot. bitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I walk in and you're the first person I see. And what were you holding? Camera. A camera. <laughs> there we go. Right, smash the buttons. Yep. Tell us what we did wrong. Ask more questions. And yeah, we are trying to uh, go to JDM Garage to pick the... Skyline parts up. So hopefully that comes off. If not, it will be uh, more videos of crap. <laughs> Job done. Job done. Right. Laters.